five years ago, no one was talking about fintech. Now, of course, that's all changed. Since its debut in Hong Kong Cybos 2009, the Inner Tribe program has evolved. It's gone from an experimental Cybos feature into a pioneering innovation initiative. It teaches us thought-provoking content that could shape our future and includes emerging ecosystems thanks to the highly anticipated Inner Tribe Startup Challenge. Now, joining me today are two visionaries. They are Gerd Lionheart and Brad Templeton. So you both have done co-hosted the session Technology and Humanity. So Brad, I'm going to start with you. So which tech change can you say has had the most impact on humanity? Well, it depends on the time horizon you want to put over the long term. I think artificial intelligence, in particular, eventually artificial general intelligence, i.e. machines that think a bit like we do, will have the largest effect. A little bit before that, I think biotechnology will be the area of great interest. Right now, uh, my near-term interest is self-driving cars, uh, because I think they're going to uh, change how we live, how our cities work, and really make a big difference in the world. Inga, do you have the same impression? Do you too believe that self-driving cars are the future? Absolutely. I mean, I, I just uh, gave up having a car. I live in Zurich, you know, because I, I think having a car will probably go out of style. Self-driving, yeah, I think assisted driving is first, and then gradually moving to using the car as if there was a human. I think that's a very, very big trend. And AI, of course, clearly, but also the convergence of biology and technology, cloud computing, 5G. I mean, the next 10 years will be mind boggling. We're talking about innovation here and all of the things that could change, but do you think that something from the government and authorities needs to be put in place before these can be mainstream? Uh, generally, I think that innovation and doing new things is, is the top priority. Uh, we should, however, not play with things that are potentially existential uh, and many of them are not so I think intelligent assistance and voice assistance that's socially consequential or culturally or jobs automation but maybe not existential to humans but we do have to think a little bit larger and ask the question why are we doing this and what if this happens and you know what's called the precautionary approach uh, mixed with proactivity I think that's very important. Hey, Brad, talking about that cautionary approach then, do you think that you know, self-driving cars or any of the initiatives that you talked about, do you think they could have any negative impact on humanity? Oh, of course. Every technology has a whole bunch of negative impacts. So far, though, we've done pretty well that the positive impacts have well outweighed the negative impacts. And we do want to think about these questions, and we do want to consider the ethics and consider where they're going. We want the people building them to consider it. We want the people in government to be considering it. What we probably don't want, though, is for the regulators to try and regulate things that don't even exist yet, uh, that we don't really understand very well. The people building it have flaws in their understanding, but the people not building it have even greater flaws in their understanding. Solving this challenge is extremely difficult. We need a foresight that's never existed in human history, and we haven't figured out how to get it yet. You, you're saying that people are actually quite scared, aren't they, about some of the things that we are building and technology. Do you think that could ever be waylaid? Uh, yes, people give up their fears very quickly when it actually works. Uh, there are polls that go on right now about self-driving cars, asking people will you ride in it. A lot of people say I won't ride in it. I'm sure they said the same thing about elevators that drove themselves so far. We're pretty comfortable with that. In fact, as I like to joke, the way that you stop an elevator when you're trying a lift, sorry, when you're trying to catch the lift, the way you do is you stick your arm into the jaws of the robot, or you send your five-year-old ahead to stick their head in the jaws of the robot, and that's how you stop the lift. Uh, that means we've obviously come to trust it a great deal. That's an interesting analogy. <laughs> Good. You know, do you think that there is a balance between technology and humanity that we could live peacefully and harmonily together? I think there is right now. Technology wasn't really so powerful that we could actually rely on it like we, like, like we rely on humans. In 10 years, technology will be unlimited in power. Quantum computing, the cloud, 5G. And that's the point where we have to say, you know, do we want technology just because it can or does it make sense, like face recognition? Right? And who is in charge? Who is mission control you know, for humanity? And those questions are not material when the stuff doesn't work. Yeah? And so far, it's just starting to work now. And if you project into the future, exponentially speaking, that's you know, 300 steps from today, 10 years. Right? Yeah, we're going to be in the future that is hard to imagine. And that's why we have to start thinking about what else does it do and who's in charge and how do we make an, an ecosystem that works for everybody? How do we have equality? Right now, technology has not created equality because that's not what it does. You know, that's what we have to do. So we have to think a little bit larger. We have to think of the externalities, you know, the consequences, automation, labor laws, 
And that should be really part of our thinking about technology. How do we make a better world in the compromise and the balance between those things that we want? But you, I mean, 10 years that you've given it, that's a very short time frame. Do you think that maybe that's too short? No, I think 10 years and now, you know, we, we can handle this in 10 years. I think, you know, if you're looking at reality in 10 years, we'll have 9 billion people on the internet. It's 3.6 now and most of them will be at high speed. Uh, so you can do instant real-time operation, telemedicine, you can do thinking machines. You, I mean, of course, 20 years will be even a further leap, you know. So what we have to think about now is how we construct something that stays good mostly so that we can reap the benefits and minimize the, the problems, you know. And right now we have mostly optimized the performance, but we have not thought about the consequences of that performance like social media, right? And that is only the first example of many that is going to require more foresight. That's all I'm asking for is basically more of a foresight-based model, uh, a model that goes beyond uh, monetary issues, you know, earning, earnings, revenues, growth, profit, uh, people, planet, purpose, prosperity, you know, a little bit larger than that. Uh, you know, we've still got that time to come, I guess. Uh, we're still learning. And Brad, you know, 10 years, 20 years, do you also think there's going to be a huge mega shift? There is going to be a huge mega shift. I disagree that it will be unlimited in 20 years. I think in 20 years they'll be complaining about all the limits and saying it'll be unlimited in 20 years and that pattern will repeat as it has throughout history. I believe that we actually are thinking about these issues. I'm also on the board of an organization called the Foresight Institute. It's over 30 years old, dedicated to examining the consequences of things like nanotechnology and AI technology. And um, there are large circles where this is very heavily debated. Is it as fully debated as it could be in the, among the general public? No, that's not true. And so there is certainly room for education and understanding and a better grip on where things are going. But we're not very good at figuring out how to regulate things that don't exist yet. And so I still am a little wary about trying to pass laws right now, trying to uh, actually say, don't do this. I think we should let things happen. I think we should find out where they're going wrong. I think we should fix them where they're going wrong. Now, if they're existential, uh, Gerd is pointing out that with a risk that great, maybe we do have to think a little bit more in advance. The only problem is with most of the things you'll call existential, which is general intelligence and uh, certain types of bioweapons, these sorts of things, um, it's a big world with a lot of countries and a lot of places, and if you decide we're not going to make this, uh, you really have very little guarantee that it won't be made by other people, and so those people may be good or evil, but it will be their values which are reflected in the technology of the future and therefore the culture of the future. So we've got a bright future to look forward to? Absolutely, I'm an optimist. You know, I think there's there's really two things about this. First, we're also in an economic uh, exchange. So the idea of uh, relentless capitalism at all costs is dying, you know, climate change automation. And so, and so we're moving towards a world that I call sustainable capitalism. Uh, and that means that, you know, we can be optimistic when we can get on the same page. And I think that is a requirement. We have to get on the same page with what we want. And that is, includes everybody, you know, China, US, everybody. Uh, and when we're on the same page, we can reach enormous things, I think. I'm, I'm certain. I'm, I think human collaboration will handle it once we have enough reason to collaborate. You know, that, that's the main thing, really. So it's a case of we're going to have a future where technology and humanity are going to be brought together, no matter what is <laughs> our future. Well, thank you so much, Brad, and thank you so much, Gerd, for your time today. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you.